you know, you have to think of lean as a time-based growth strategy because every time you remove the waste, you shorten the time that it takes to do anything. And if you can shorten the time, you're gonna gain tremendous competitive advantage. And, and that's the reason we do lean is, is for competitive advantage. We're trying to deliver more value to our customers than the other guy can. What's up, everybody? This is Paul Critchley, president of New England Lean Consulting. Welcome to another episode of the New England Lean Podcast. Uh, before I get to the introduction of our guest this week, I do have a small favor to ask. If you are enjoying the show, if you wouldn't mind hitting subscribe and uh, maybe hitting the five stars in Apple Podcasts or a like on whatever system that you use to listen to our, our little show here, I would greatly appreciate it. It helps the algorithms find us and suggest us, so it helps us uh, reach out to more people who you know may not be able to, or may not be finding us. So if you would do that I, again, it would be greatly appreciated. Now I am wicked excited to bring you the guest that we have this week because it was another none other than Art Byrne. Now, if you're listening to the show, I'm going to guess you probably already know who Art is. Um, he's he's a legend, really, within the lean community, as far as I'm concerned. And those are my words, nobody else's. Um, certainly a lean veteran, but he's done some amazing things in his career. And he takes us through that story arc in this episode. So I'm not going to spoil anything or try to summarize it here. Um because he does a very eloquent job of doing so. But he really explains how Lean kind of came to him, how it you know, made sense in his head and what he's done since then to kind of uh, practice it, implement these things. Um, so he, he brings us from his time at GE on to Danaher and specifically Jacobs Vehicle Systems and then on to Wire Mold, which is if you know, if you don't know his whole story arc, you probably know him best for Wire Mold because of the book that he wrote called The Lean Turnaround, which is the story of what he and his team did at Wire Mold. Um, and I've known a lot of people who have worked at uh, both Jake Brake and Wire Mold during the times when Art was there. So, um, you know, I kind of heard about it. I'll say secondhand while it was happening because again i don't live far from either of those places and i and i know a lot of people who were there during those times um and certainly it created a bit of a i'll say a buzz um amongst the connecticut manufacturing community while they were kind of going through all this kind of stuff so um just in brief from the time art took over as ceo at wire mold to the time that they sold that company less than 10 years later they had increased the enterprise value by 2500 percent and, you know, by enterprise value, it also includes all of the other, you know, basic uh, KPIs and business metrics that you may expect, you know, on-time delivery and customer satisfaction and, and all that kind of stuff. So he talks a lot about that and he talks about, you know, how he did it and how he engaged with people. Um, and it's just, it was such an honor to have him on the show. Art has such a, an amazing history and per perspective um i just i just want you guys everybody to listen to this and, and kind of soak it in because it was uh amazing to be able to have them on the show and again art again uh, thank you so much if you're listening um i greatly appreciate that you agreed to come on um so just give a listen i've probably listened to it five times as i've been editing it and no kidding, every single time I listen, I hear Art say something else that I missed the previous time because there's so much great information in here. So as always, everybody, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you get something out of it. Have a fantastic week. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Welcome to the New England Lean podcast. Uh, it's a, As I mentioned in the intro, our guest today is Art Byrne. Art, it's an honor, sir, to have you on the show. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Sure. No, I'm so. I, when I reached out, I it was a it was a long shot. I'm like, I don't know if, I don't know if Art's going to even remember who I am. But I figured I'd shoot my shot. 
Okay, well, we're here. Let's let's get started. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, obviously, anybody who's listening to this podcast probably already knows who you are. But on the off chance that we have a new listener, or we do have a few in lean healthcare who may not know your story. Could you just maybe hum a few bars of sure. you know, who you are and how you got to where you got to? All right. Well, I started my own lean journey back in the beginning of 1982. It was my, during my first general manager job at the General Electric Company. I was, the, I was the general manager of what was then called the High Intensity and Quartz Lamp Department. It was a part of the lighting business group, which was a much bigger business. And we just started a, 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 a Kanban system between myself and another one of my suppliers, who was also a part of the lighting business group. And you know what happened is we bought a, a little truck and they, they were supplying, the High Intensity and Quartz Lamp Department made a lot of the over outdoor lighting, all your street lights, the bulbs, we're talking about the bulbs, not the fixtures. Okay. Uh, and we made, you know, high bay factory lighting, that kind of stuff, high pressure sodium, uh, uh, multi-vapor, mercury lamps, those kind of things. And so we were buying our arc tubes from one of the other businesses within the lighting business group. And we bought a little van and we <clears throat> um, created a Kanban system so that Every day, the, this other business was about a 45 minute drive away from my factory. And every day that van would come to my factory and we would hand them the can bands of the things that we used the day before. And the next day they would bring those back. That was basically what we did. Well, my inventory went from, of these arc tubes went from 43 days down to three. And their inventory went from, I don't know, 50 or 60 days. They had a whole huge room full of these things down to zero. They had none. So for the lighting business group, we probably, we probably went from you know, close to 100 days down to three days of inventory of these arc tubes. And they were expensive little parts. Uh, but you know, no one in GE at that time really cared about that. The, the, the whole thrust of GE back in those days was make the month or die. Mm. And so the idea that you could reduce inventory that much was irrelevant. But what, I, what we found was, gee, you know, there were lots of other benefits that came from doing this, which is, you know, my customer service got way better. My quality got better. I freed up a lot of space. We got better productivity. My, my workforce was happier and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the gains went on and on and on from just doing this little campaign system. So I was really hooked and I decided that from then on any business that I ran, I was gonna try and use this approach. Now, that in 1982, this was just known as just in time. Uh, it was something that came from Japan and nobody really knew too much about it. Um, so when I left GE a, a, a little while later and I, I joined Danaher as a group executive, uh, and there, uh, my, my headquarters were actually in Connecticut, in Bloomfield, Connecticut, in the Jake Brake uh, building, which was, Jake Brake was one of my, my companies. Um, and so there we started a, a fairly aggressive lean program, starting with Jake Brake, which, makes engine retarders for diesel trucks uh, and J its sister company, Jacobs Chuck. And we started our, on our own. It was still called Just In Time at that point. This was 1986, basically. And by early 1987, we found that there, we, we were using a book called Kaizen. No, no. Yeah, called, uh, yeah, called Kaizen by a guy named Masaki Amai. And that was really helpful to us at the time. And we found out that Amai was going to run a seminar in Hartford in sometime in the spring of 1987. And so we said, gee, we ought to go and listen to this. It's just down the street. So George Konensaker, who ran Jake Brake at the time, reported to me. Uh, he signed us up and he took about five or six of his people. And I went along just for the first two days. It was a one week seminar, but I could only be there for a couple of days. And Amai was not, not a... He, he wasn't an implementer of Lean. He wrote the book and stuff, but he, he needed someone to help him do this. And he brought these three guys from Japan that knew they had just formed a new company called Shin Jiu Jitsu. And all three of them had all worked their whole careers at Toyota. And the last 10 years before they formed Shin Jiu Jitsu, they had worked directly for Taichi Ono, who was known as the father of, of, Lean, of Lean, of the Toyota production system. Um, <clears throat> and so they were doing the training the first couple of days and then the thing moved the last three days to a, a local factory someplace. 
In any event, after we listened to him the first two days, Konasaker and I said, boy, these are the guys, we had already created a couple of cells and we had done some things at Jake Break, but not, it wasn't very great. It was, but we had gone in the right direction, but it, we needed more help. So these are the right guys. We got to get these guys to come and help us. So Konensaker got all over him during the week and actually invited him out one night after dinner around 11 o'clock at night and into the Jake Break factory. They almost caused a riot. Um, I met with them uh, on Thursday afternoon and then they came back on Saturday and Basically, we were kind of begging them to come and, and help us. And their response was, look, no, we're too old. We don't speak English. It's too far away, blah, blah, blah. And we said, yes, but, you know, we have uh, lots of great steaks and we have lobsters and, oh, and we have golf. We have lots of, oh, they liked golf. So they thought about it. And anyway, myself and the head of Jacob's Chuck were going to be in Japan in another couple of months. So we met with them again there, and they agreed that they would come and, and start to consult for us. Uh, we were their first client in the United States. Um, <clears throat> and the first meeting that we had was actually in Jacob's Chuck in, in Clemson, South Carolina. And that was really interesting. You know, we didn't know how to work with them. We had gotten some interpreters from the local Clemson University. And we, we started with an introduction of how a drill truck works. That lasted about two seconds. They said, look, we have those in Japan too. What do you want to do next? So let's take a, let's take a plant tour. So we go out in the plant and we figured the plant tour is going to take about an hour and a half, which is what it would normally take. We got about 100 yards into the plant. They held up their hands and they said, okay, we've seen enough. Let's go back in the conference room. So we said, well, yeah, but we just start. No, no, let's go back. So we went back in the conference room. And Mr. Iwata, who was the head of Shin Jiu Jitsu, he goes up on the board and in huge letters, he writes, no good on the board. And he turns around looks at us and he says, look, everything here is no good. What do you want to do about it? And so really that's how we started right then. We broke up into two teams. Iwata took uh, myself and the president of Jacob's Chuck out into the assembly area. And we had four or five of these sort of conveyor belt assembly lines in operation. And of course, the first thing he says is, look, I hate conveyor belts, get rid of them. And we, we, we kind of choked on that, but then he explained it and et cetera. The other team, on the other hand, they moved about maybe six pieces of equipment that had been in the plant for 20 years and never moved. And they set up the first cell that we ever had. Now, they couldn't, they couldn't hook, up, hook it back up. They just moved the stuff and, and showed us what it's going to be like. We had to hook it up later, but that's how we started. And you know, from there, you know, the Jake break took the lead and we, we made tremendous progress. And eventually we spread this to all the, all of the uh, 13 companies at that time in Danaher. Uh, we took all the presidents and all the VPs of operations to Japan for a week and showed them what lean looked like. Uh, you know, again, it wasn't called lean then it was still called the Toyota production system. Uh, so that's, that's how we started. And they were our, we were their only US client for about four years. And we made tremendous progress at Jake Break and a bunch of other places. Um, and then eventually when I left and one of the other group executives left, uh, there were only two of us at the time, but when we both left, we took Shin Jiu Jitsu with us. And so when I went to Wiremold, uh, A, I had Shin Jiu Jitsu going to consult for us at Wiremold, which was great. But more importantly, I had learned an awful lot about, about the Toyota production system by spending a lot of time with them. Whenever they were in town, I tried to spend the whole week with them. We'd play golf with them on the weekends, we'd have dinner with them at night, we'd spend the time on the shop floor. Because lean is something that you have to learn by doing. You can't do this um, out of a book or out of a seminar or something like that. You get some ideas, but unless you actually do it and participate, you'll never learn this stuff. And it's really hard to lead it if you don't participate, if you don't understand it, if you don't really understand it, you know, in, in depth. And the only way to, to learn that is by doing it. And so I spent a lot of time with Shin Jiu Jitsu and trying to learn this stuff because I thought it was very important. So for example, when I went to Wiremol, we, we we, I said, we're gonna just try and fix this with, Wiremol was having a lot of problems. The, you know, earnings were kind of, I mean, sales were kind of flat and earnings were down 80% in the two years before I got there. Um, and so, you know, it was the big, it was like a, a crisis right off the bat. Yeah. And uh, so I so said, we're gonna use lean to do this. And, you know, I was out on the shop floor very early on and I 
we had a lot of different kinds of equipment at Wiremole. And Wiremole, for those of you who don't aren't familiar with it, we made products for the electrical industry, mostly raceway and fittings, but we also made GFCI, some specialty lighting things, and, and a bunch of other different products. But raceway and fittings to rewire a building were, were the main product that, that Wiremole was famous for. In any event, I was out on the shop floor early on and I saw a roll, we had a bunch of rolling mills. Now I had never seen a rolling mill before, but okay, now I own rolling mills. And so I asked, I said, you know, how long does it take to change over this rolling mill? And they said, well, it takes 14 hours. And of course I said, oh, 14 hours, we can't have that. We have to do it under 10 minutes. And, you know, I, now I would have, I would have never said that if I hadn't had the experience of working with Shin Jiu-Jitsu and understanding what was possible in setup reduction. So if I hadn't learned by doing, I would have never even said something like that. And of course I knew when I said that, that people were all gonna say, who's this guy? He's right. not, we just told him it takes 14 hours and he wants us to do it under 10 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if I had just said, well, look, you really need to get it under 10 minutes, get, get to work on it and let me know how we're doing. Nothing would have happened of course, right? Because everybody was convinced it takes 14 hours had been for the last 10 years or however long they own the machine. So we started, we didn't do that. We just said, okay, well, let's start the first Kaizen and then the next Kaizen. And we, we built cardboard mock-ups and we did all kinds of stuff. We couldn't get at the machine that much because it was very needed to make production. We had to do it on weekends and holidays, things like that. So it took us about 18 months, but after 18 months, we could change the machine in six minutes. Now, you know, now people say, well, gee, that, that was really interesting. You know, I wonder what his next stupid idea is going to be. <laughs> right. And, and uh, you know, but that's how, that's how, how lean really works is uh, learn by doing and people buy in and, and get on board when they see the changes and start to understand, holy smokes, look what can happen here, right? Um, and, and so we had Shin Jiu Jitsu, we had another group called Moffat Associates. These were, Moffat was a spinoff out of uh, Danaher that, that uh, he had worked for me at Danaher. I had made him the first Kaizen promotion office and, and Danaher was a guy named Bill Moffat. So he had gone out on his own. So we were using him and we were using Shin Jiu Jitsu and, and we were using them to run Kaizans for us, but also to train my own Kaizen promotion office. We created a Kaizen promotion office at Wiremo early on and staffed it with some of our better people and the idea was to make Kaizen promotion office for say two years uh, and have them do nothing but Kaizen the whole time. That's the only thing we wanted them to do when they were in there. And this way they were gonna really learn how this works, to, to learn by doing, if you will. Uh, and, and then we could move them to other parts of the, the business, right? We could promote them into being team leaders and that kind of thing. And so we started at, at Wiremold and one of, the, one of the first things we did, which I think is important for any kind of learn, lean implementation, is we changed from a, a, a functional structure to a value stream structure. You know, most companies today, even they, they have what I call a functional structure. In other words, somehow we, we seem to think that similar machines, if you have similar machines, if you put them all together, in the same area, the machines will be happier because they're near other machines just like them. We must think that way because that's how we set everything up, right? And of course, when you do that, that creates tremendous waste. Uh, just, just that functional setup creates most of the waste that exists in a, in a traditional batch company. And for, in my experience, the traditional batch company has 25 to four, before they start lean, uh, they have 25 to 40% too many people. They have five to six times too much inventory. They got 40 to 50% too much floor space. And they've got really long lead times because when you produce in a batch and with functional departments, it takes a long time to move everything through the system, right? And, you know, and it also it is a, it's a big mess for quality because if it takes you six weeks to do something, at the end of the six weeks, you find out, oh, the product doesn't work. It doesn't go together. It didn't pass the test. Well, when, where did the problem occur? Well, I got eight different departments and each department has 10 different machines, all similar. And each one, each department has 20 people that work on two shifts on these 10 machines. And I buy my raw material from three different vendors. And six weeks later, when I find the problem, 
how do I know where it, where would it, where it happened, right? Trying to solve that in any permanent way is almost impossible. So, you know, a, a functional organizations are what cause almost all of the issues that exist in traditional companies, in my opinion. I mean, at least that's really a gold mine. And so the first thing we did was we shifted from a functional organization at Wiremold to a value stream organization. <clears throat> and that value stream organization, then we, we added on top of that, we said, we, you know, if we're going to do lean, we, what we're really trying to do is to compete on our operational excellence. And so we define, you know, if you're going to do that, you got to define what operational excellence means to you. And then you got to try and do that. And so for us, we define, and, and all of these, all your operational excellence goals have to be stretch, stretch goals. You know, in other words, if you're turning inventory three times and you set a goal of turning inventory five times, well, that's not much of a stretch. And people will say, well, okay, we can uh, three to five, we can get there. We'll just do what we're doing a little bit better, mm -hmm. right? So instead we, we set goals and our, we just had five goals, five operational excellence goals. One of them was 100% on-time customer service, uh, not 97 or 98%, but 100% period. Uh, we wanted a 50% reduction in defects every year. We wanted a 20% productivity gain every year. Um, we wanted 20 times inventory turns. We were at three. So you can imagine what people said when I said that, right. you know, are you crazy? We can't go from three to 20. Well, yeah, you can. Um, and then we said we wanted the 5S and visual control every place. So those were our operational excellence goals. They were all, you, know, you could call them aspirational. In other words, that was what we were. We, we, we felt if we could get to these goals, we were going to change the nature of the company dramatically. And they were the kind of goals that, are, that I think of them as process goals. They're aimed at your processes, right? Most companies think in terms of make the month and you know, they spend their time looking backwards at what happened last month, but they never change the processes. So if, if you're gonna look backwards every month at the end of the month on how you did, but you're not gonna change the processes that, that, that created that result, then guess what? You're gonna have the same result the next month. Right. And on and on and on and on. But but people, for some reason, they don't seem to get that. It's just, let's just keep doing big financial reviews at the end of the month. So we said, no, no, no. We're going to have these five operational excellence goals. They're all stretch goals. We don't expect to get them to happen overnight. I mean, you're not going to go from three inventory turns to 20 inventory turns by next Thursday, not even next year or two years or three years, right? But you can make progress towards that every year. And that was what we tried to do. And so once we had a value stream organization and a value stream organization, the way I would define it is we, we organized it by product family, if you will. So we took someone and put them in charge of each of product family. We had about eight different product families that, that had a team leader. <clears throat> and we, we made sure that those team leaders had all the equipment necessary to make the product from raw material to in the box complete. We didn't want them to have any excuses as to why they couldn't get the thing done. Of course, in a functional organization, everybody has an excuse, right? When something happens, they just point the finger at somebody else and say, well, I could have done it, but Joe didn't get me the parts or Harry didn't get me the, the other parts. Uh, and, and they just point at each other, nothing ever happened. So we said, we got to eliminate that. So by having a team leader that was in charge of everything and had all the equipment, they, they, we took away the excuses. And so that helped a great deal. Um, and then we, what we did is we, we deployed these five operational excellence goals down to these team leaders. And each week, instead of meeting once a month with a big financial review, we said, forget that, that doesn't, that's a waste of time. Um, we, we, we met every week with the eight team leaders and my whole, myself and my whole management team. So we had about a one hour meeting. They each had 10 minutes to present. And all we asked them to present on was, how are you doing on the five operational excellence goals? What's your status? And tell us what your plans are for next week for improvement. What are you gonna do next week to get better, right? And they each had 10 minutes. And if they went over the 10 minutes, people would boo and yell at them and whatever. We had a digital clock up on the wall. And so we had some fun with that. Uh, and management was there not to criticize them, but to help. Mm -hmm. And so we had all, everybody, all the decision makers were in the room. If we needed something, 
we could have it right away. We, we, we didn't have to go through any hoops or any analysis, nothing. We could decide it right on the spot. Uh, and we had built up a pretty good Kaizen promotion office. And so if a team was lagging behind, we could focus the Kaizen promotion office on that team for a while to see if we couldn't catch them up and get them into a better shape, right? And so when, when you run things that way, uh, as opposed to big end of the month reviews, uh, everything is going to change because these team leaders basically were responsible for the biggest chunk of all our people, right? They, they had the biggest hunk of the people. So now we've got everybody in the company aimed at these five operational excellence goals every day. That's the daily work every day to figure out how to get to these goals. We were pretty far away from them all when we started, of course, but, you know, it, it's, it's really significant when you start to organize and do things that way. And, you know, it's one of the biggest hurdles that I run into over time with management is when you say you want to set a goal of, of let's say you want to set a goal of going a 50% reduction in defects every year, any kind of stretch goal, basically, it, it, it's a big pushback from, from general managers and CEOs. They don't want to do that. They think if they set a goal, it's way too high, way too big. Everybody will lose interest because they know they can't do it and they'll just quit. Right. Mm -hmm. And I look at it the other way around. I think, you know, I think setting stretch goals is really the best way to respect your people. Because if you were un unwilling to set stretch goals, what you're really saying is, look, I don't really think my people can do this. And so I I'm not going to set a goal that they can't do. But what that disrespects them because they can do this. And, you know, it's like the example of 14 hours to six minutes on the, on the rolling mill. They all said they couldn't do it, but I knew they could, right? So if I set a goal of let's go from 14 hours to 13 or 12 or some goofy thing, we would have never got beyond 14. And so, um, you know, if you take the example of 50% reduction in defects, uh, the traditional manager is going to say, well, gee, I can't, Art, I can't set that kind of goal. My people will reject that. And so I said, well, what's your goal going to be? Well, we want to reduce defects by 5% next year. Okay, I said 50%, he says five. Now, let's say at the end of the year, that team beats their goal by 50%. They get a 7.5% reduction in defects. My team, on the other hand, was kind of depressed. We've missed our goal by 20%. We only got a 40% reduction in defects. So who's winning this, right? right. I got 40, you got 7.5. I'm right. killing you. I'm killing you. And yet my people feel a little depressed they're going to work harder because we didn't even come close your team on the other hand figures ah, oh, we got this no problem they're going to relax and not do very much anymore because they you know they're they already beat the goal with nothing to prove and so the combination is over time over a couple of years i'm going to just bury you and the same on all of these other goals as well uh, we we found for example you know on the inventory turns uh, target um we we were able to Every time we bought a new company, and we bought 21 companies over about nine years, uh, we were able, mostly we bought companies that only were turning their inventory three times, which <clears throat> that's like a gold mine when you find something like that. That's, right. a, that's a terrific thing. And we, we knew that we could get the turns the first year from three to six and, and then go on up from there. Maybe by the third year, we were 10 times or something like that. But in essence, because of that, we could pretty much pay back all the cash that we laid out to buy the company, all that cash would come back to us within about three years. An inventory reduction was a big piece of where we got the cash back from, right? And, and so, you know, if you take these five goals, 100% on time customer service, 50% reduction in defects every year, 20% reduction in inventory, in productivity every year, uh, inventory turns go at 20 times, and 5S and the uh, visual control, if you take those things and say, well, gee, Art, that's too many. I only want two goals. Okay. The two goals that you would select would be 100% on-time customer service and inventory turns. Absolutely. Those are the goals because in order to get both of those going up at the same time, everything else has to fall in line. When you get to 20 times inventory turns, you have to have good productivity. You have to have really good quality. All, all the other things that you that would that have been causing you problems in the past will go away in order to be able to do 20 times inventory turns. And I, I think it's a thing that 
most people that run businesses don't recognize is that I always tell people, look, the things that you do to improve your balance sheet are the things that will drive your earnings. Mm-hmm. You know, most people take the balance sheet for granted. It just is what it is. Nothing we can do about that. But but it's not. Uh, you know, the, the, you can do a lot, obviously, with inventory turns. There's also opportunities and accounts receivable and things like that, right? And so, you know, but it, the things that you do, for example, to improve inventory turns, they're going to improve your quality, your productivity. They're going to reduce your lead time. They help you grow the top line sales because you're faster than anybody else. And so, but no one thinks of it that way. They just say, well, it's just the balance sheet. Yeah, we don't know about the balance sheet. Right. And, right. and so lean is, uh, you know, the, the, the problem what most companies have is, first of all, they, they think of it only as a cost reduction program. I would say 95% of all companies that start down the lean path say we're doing it for cost reduction. Yeah. And they're missing the point completely, of course, when they do that, because that's not, that's not why you do it. Will you get cost reduction? Absolutely, you'll get a lot of cost reduction. But you have to look at that, that's the side benefit. The real benefit is if I can take my lead times from six weeks to two days, the gain that I get from that is astronomical because every time one of my competitors stumbles a little bit, I can take that business and I can take it at full book price. Mm-hmm. And I'm probably gonna get the repeat business as well because I'm there when you need it, right? It's kind of like, I, I always like the example of, if, if you had a factory in Minnesota and it's the middle of February, and it's 20 below zero out, and some truck driver backs into one of your uh, the bay, one of your big garage doors that you have, uh, shipping shipping docks, if you will, and knocks it off, and breaks the whole thing. So now that's just 20 degrees below zero is coming into the factory. And so you got to get this door fixed. What are you going to do? You call the first two guys, and they say, "Well, yeah, we can we can sell you a new door for 1,200 bucks. It'll take you uh, four weeks." And he said, well, "We're freezing to death." And then the third guy says. Well, I can sell you a door for 2,500 bucks. I can have it in three days. What are you going to do? Yeah. It's clear what you're going to do in that particular case. But that same example occurs every place, everywhere. So, you know, you have to think of lean as a time-based growth strategy because every time you remove the waste, you shorten the time that it takes to do anything. And if you can shorten the time, you're going to gain tremendous competitive advantage. And, and that's the reason we do lean is, is for competitive advantage. We're trying to deliver more value to our customers than the other guy can, right? Mm-hmm. And at some point, as you get better and better internally and you start to improve your internal things, you're going to wind up having to go to your customers to change some of their behavior because they're batch guys too. They order in batch, they do everything in batch. Um, and, and when you can deliver on a regular basis, why are they ordering in batch? At Wiremold, you know, we sold to electrical distributors. So we had a lot of customers all over the country. And once we got to be pretty good, we would go to them and say, look, <clears throat> we, we had set up a trucking routes to them where anybody that was of any kind of reasonable size, not the really small guys, but anybody of reasonable size, we would say, look, you're gonna be on this trucking route. And that means we're gonna come to your location every Thursday, sometimes between noon and two o'clock in the afternoon. And we could hit that pretty much 100%. And they really liked that. That was very dependable. They really liked it. So once we had that in place, then we went to them and said, look, you know, how much, uh, how much inventory of our stuff do you carry? And, you know, typical electrical distributor, the answer was three to four months worth. Mm-hmm. And the whole, their whole theory is, hey, you can't sell from an empty wagon. Yeah. So they, they were happy with the inventory. And then most of their suppliers weren't very reliable. So they carried like four months worth of inventory. And we said, yeah, well, that, that's interesting. But, you know, we show up every, every Thursday between 12 and 2. Why are you carrying four months worth of inventory when I come every week? And I said, oh, yeah, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? So what do you want us to do? So now we had to work with them and train them. And we said, we want you to, first of all, we're going to show you how to get rid of the inventory and stop ordering in big batches when you order. We just want you to tell us every day what you sold that day. And you, at the end of the day, tell us what you sold today. We'll take that as an order. And when the truck comes next Thursday, everything that you sold up until Tuesday night will be on the truck on Thursday, right? 
So we're going to replenish what you have. That means you don't need four months worth anymore. Why don't we take it down to, you know, we'll go first to two months, then we'll go down to one month. And then we, then we could say, all right, now we're giving you back a lot of cash and a lot of space in your warehouse from taking that inventory out. Let's, let's invest some of that into more of our SKUs because we had a lot of fittings and odd things that, you know, that there was just too many for someone to carry. Uh, so they would in, invest in that. And pretty soon they became the electrical distributor in their community that everybody went to when they were going to do a wire mold job because they were always in stock of everything. Mm -hmm. And when they weren't, they could get it real fast because we were coming every Thursday. Um, and, and most of them, they grew their sales about 10% of our product and their profitability about 20% once we could get them to do it. It wasn't easy to get them to do this, by the way, and we didn't get any, everybody to do it, but we got quite a few of our distributors to do this. And so, you know, as you get better, eventually you're going to have to go out to your, to your customers and you're going to have to work with them to get them on board to do the right thing as well. Uh, but, you know, once you do this stuff and one, one you know, the other, on the other end of it, the, the, uh, the purchasing side, um, then the, the, the same is sort of true there. When we started Lean at Wiremold, we said, okay, if you want to sell to us, you got to deliver every day. And of course, they all said, no, everybody said, no, we can't yeah, do that. Yeah, how are we going to do that, right? Yeah, we can't do that. That's crazy. So we started it with our cardboard box suppliers. We had three of them at the time. And we had this pretty big internal cardboard box warehouse in the plaque, or in the factory. It took up a lot of space. Uh, and we, we went to them and said, you know, you want, you gotta, you're going to have to start to deliver daily. And they all said, no, we can't do that. So we kept badgering him and badgering him. We finally got one guy to try it. And we started to work with him. And he said, you know, this is really hard because you buy so many different boxes. I can't set my machines up fast enough to respond to what you want. And so we sent a team over and showed him how to do setup reduction. He was real happy with that. Uh, and then later on, we sent another team over to show him how to put Kanban cards on the bundles of cardboard that he sent us. And so when the cardboard came in every day, we could deliver it right to the to the, uh, the team that was using that, the product family team that was using that cardboard. It, would, it wouldn't go into a cardboard warehouse anymore. We get rid of that. And it would come in every day and go right to the line side, right? And we had a Kanban card on the bundle. And every time we opened up a new bundle, we took out the Kanban card, we put in a little box. End of the day, people went, somebody went around and gathered up all the box, all the Kanban cards. Next morning when the guy came, we gave him the Kanban cards, right? So that's all we did, but you know, it was tremendously efficient for us and for him. And of course, his two competitors, after a while, they came back and said, "Hey, what happened to our orders?" You know, mm -hmm. what? we said, "Well, we, you know, we wanted you to deliver every day," and you said you couldn't do that. Oh, oh we didn't know you were serious. We could do that now. You know, <laughs> we said, "Sorry, too late." Right. right. And and so, you know, one of the things that we did as we went through this, we we did a similar thing across the board. So we went from something like. 340 or 50 raw material suppliers down to about 42 uh, and dropped dramatically. And then we got rid of our purchasing department and we got rid of our production planning department. And we, we combined those. So each team leader had a, an individual called a buyer planner. And that buyer planner was responsible for purchasing the things that were unique to his or her team, right? The, the things that were the major things like steel and plastic and things like that we bought, there's only five or six of those things. We, we, we negotiated those contracts annually at, a much, at, a, at the VP of operations level basically with, and, and they could release against those. But the things that were unique to their team, they were responsible for buying. And they were also responsible for their own production planning. Uh, and the whole theory of this was you know, in the before we had a production planning department that was planning to do one thing and a purchasing department that wasn't planning to buy the stuff that they were planning to make because they weren't talking to each other, right? Mm -hmm. and we figured, well, if you make it all one person, it's a little harder to fake yourself out. Right. And, and it worked very well. And so we, we had tremendous cost reduction in the process and we had something that was much more efficient, right? I mean, I, I always... I, to me, I, I look at the, this has been a trend over maybe 30 years or so with, you know, companies have operations and they have supply chain. And to me, that's a little nuts, right? Because 
that they should all be one. I mean, it's all one thing. It's, it, it shouldn't be separate things. And what happens is then they say, okay, we're going to have management managed by objectives. So we're going to tell the guy in charge of supply chain, we, your job this year and your bonus is going to be dependent on bringing down the cents each cost of everything that we buy. Okay. That's his target. And then we tell the operations guy, your target this year is you got to bring down the inventory and get our inventory turns up. Okay. That's your bonus. That's your target. Now, of course, we've just set them completely against each other, right? Mm -hmm. Supply chain guy, in order to bring down the cents each cost, he's going to buy in the biggest batches he can get a hold of. And the operations guy is trying to buy, bring down inventory. This stuff just keeps showing up. He, he can do certain things, but then the supply chain guy brings in all the inventory. It's, it's, to me, this is completely nuts. But this is how people do things. And they think, oh, yeah, this is really brilliant. But I think it's really stupid. Uh, because you you know it's all one thing. Now you want to you want to pull system from the raw material supplier right right into your factory right to the line side. When I first got to Wyoming, we had four months worth of steel. We bought, bought a lot of coil steel, four months worth. We got that down. We we went from several suppliers down to one supplier. We got that down to like one and a half to two days worth of steel. We were getting something like six to eight truckloads of steel every day. Mm. And the supplier was in Baltimore, Maryland. We were in Hartford, Connecticut, or, or Bloomfield Hills. Or, you know, no, we were in Hartford. So um, anyway, you know, think of the gain that you get when you do something like that, right? You free up a lot of space. You free up a lot of cash. But the, the, the main thing is now you never run out. I mean, think of why, why the companies run out and why do they have problems and why do the vendors have problems? Well, because... Somebody makes a mistake and they forget to order uh, steel number 27. And then, oh my God, we don't have any steel number 27. We got a bunch of orders coming up. So I call my supplier and I say, I need three months worth of this stuff right now. Hmm. Well, he can't produce three months right now. He doesn't have the capacity for that. <clears throat> but if instead I'm telling him every day what I used and he's sending that back to me the next day, I'm never stressing his capacity at all. Right. And, and I've, you know, I've got a tremendous relationship with him because he, you know, he, he's got a steady customer. He knows what we're going to do. We, we, we work on a forecast and stuff, but we, we, he doesn't know what's going to show up tomorrow, but we, we can have a general forecast with him. And, you know, people say, oh, well, you can't just have one supplier. Well, I, I understand some of the aspects of that, but you can certainly have somebody who's 80, 85 percent of your supply and maybe somebody who's 20. Um, but, you know, when we got to one steel supplier, of course, that steel supplier then decides he's going to raise the price. Mm. So we had a little discussion with them. We said, well, you know, what about the, you remember those other two or three guys you used to compete with? They still want the business back. So I'm going to guarantee you, you raise the price, you're going to lose 80% of this business overnight. What do you want to do? Mm. Well, we didn't get any ever price increase from him. He just said, okay, I get it. I'll be quiet. <laughs> We said, look, you know, if we give you, we gave you three times the volume that you ever had before. Are you saying that you're not productive enough with three times the volume to actually bring down our prices as opposed to thinking that you got us now and you're going to squeeze us with a price increase? So that's a very easy discussion to have, right? And so it's not something you should be afraid of. Um, but anyway, uh, that's kind of the, the things that we did. And of course, you know, we had uh, we had profit sharing in Wiremold, and I'm a big believer in profit sharing, particularly when it, when you attach it to lean, because the the, the improvements that you're going to get are going to be done by the people that are doing the work. Uh, always the best ideas to take out the waste are going to come from the people that are doing the work because they know what the waste is. They've been trying to tell you for 20 years, and you never listened to them before, right? Right. And so, you know, those people should get rewarded, and so we had a a profit sharing plan when I got there that had been in place since the founding of the company almost a hundred years before uh, the owner at the time believed in that. And so he created a profit sharing plan and the profit sharing plan was very simple. And, and if you're going to do profit sharing, you have to make it simple. I, I see all these people that do gain sharing and all this other complicated stuff. And that stuff never works because people don't believe it. It's too complicated. They can't understand what you're doing. Profit sharing done correctly, on the other hand, is very, very simple. If we shared profit from dollar one. If we made a dollar, we'll share it. 
if we lost a dollar, well, there's nothing to share. So that we didn't we didn't come and take it back a dollar. We just said, sorry, we didn't make anything this month. Um, but we shared it from dollar one. And what we did is we said we take 50, we took 15% of the pre-tax profits, and that created a pool of money. We divided that by the straight time wages for everybody, because we didn't want to incent overtime and any of that kind of stuff. And that that division created a profit sharing percentage. And then every quarter we paid out a check on profit sharing based on your straight time wages time this was times this percentage that's what you got and we posted the results every month paid out once a quarter so everybody was always on board with the changes we were making and the improvements we were making because this was going to go in their pocket mm -hmm. and we said up front that we want when we started this profit sharing was paying out about 1% that a rate of about 1% of people's pay in general. And I, I said, no, I want that to be 20% of your pay. And I, it was just a number I grabbed out of the air, but it was high enough that it would make a difference. I wanted to get people's attention. If our target is to try and make profit sharing 20% of, of, of your wage and your wage has to be competitive locally or we're not gonna keep you anyway. So that's an extra 20% bonus that everybody has an opportunity to do if we do well. And so that's how we started. And we, we got to 20%, yeah, a few quarters here and there, but generally we settled out around 12 to 14%. But that's a big difference from, from, from one. And the reason that we settled out there was every time we did an acquisition, we charged the cost of any interest we had to borrow to do that or whatever against the profit sharing. And so we could explain that to people and they understood, okay, well, they went and did another acquisition, hurt my profit sharing this month, but you know, it's gonna be better longer term. Mm -hmm. So it was very clear to everybody all the time what we were doing. And it, at the same time, we, we also encouraged everybody to be part of our 401k plan because profit sharing was for the short term, but the 401k plan was for the longer term. And we said, we'll match your contribution in Wiremole stock. Now, Wiremole wasn't a public company, but we did have a stock and we did evaluate it every year and all that kind of thing. And so at the time that, you know, 10 years later when we sold Wiremole and we had increased enterprise value by about 2,500% over that 10 year period. So a massive increase in the value of the company. And the nicest thing of all was the Number one, the biggest shareholder was the employees through the 401k plan. The 401k plan was the biggest shareholder. And that meant the employees were the biggest shareholder. So they created the gains. They got the biggest payout on the gains. So it all worked very, very nicely when you think of it that way. And, you know, that's really, uh, that's really what happened. And we had a lot of very happy people at the end. Right. So, so, you know, lean is, lean is something that, can, can do great in any environment. I, I, uh, I volunteered to do some Kaizen for St. Francis Hospital in Hartford when I lived there. And, you know, that was interesting because the gains you can get in a hospital are astronomical. Most hospitals are, are really poorly managed. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have, I mean, it's a very odd thing because you've got very, very smart, very dedicated people working in hospitals. They're there because they want to be there. They're there because they want to help. They're committed to what they're doing, et cetera. But they're organized into fiefdoms. You know, they, are, they have all these fiefdoms and the fiefdom is this and they have fiefdoms within fiefdoms. And therefore, with all the fiefdoms, they're very, very inefficient. Uh, and, and they don't know how to get out of that. And so, you know, I did a bunch of Kaizen's for them and the gains were always astronomical. Getting them to stick in the hospital was harder because they would always kind of go back to what they were doing before. Yeah. And, you know, I remember at the time, every time I'd start a Kaizen team in the hospital, they'd always give me a bunch of great people to, to be on the team. And it was going to be a whole week long. And I'd always say, okay, we're going to work on this this week. What's the, what's the biggest problem? And they always said the same thing. They said, it's the doctors. I said, what do you mean it's the doctors? Well, it's the doctors. Well, what's wrong with the doctors? Well, they're arrogant. They don't show up on time and the blah, blah, blah. They, they, you know, they had a big list of things. And I said, wait a minute, look. I said, this is a hospital. St. Francis at the time had about 5,000 employees. Hospitals are very big employers, as you probably know. They had 5,000 employees. And I said, only 500 are doctors. 
So I said, look, I want you, we're not gonna, we're not, none of us are doctors. We're, we're not gonna do doctoring this week. We're gonna do Kaizen. And so, but I guarantee you that if we fix what the 4,500 people are doing, you won't have any issues with the doctors anymore. The only reason that you're having problems with them is they're trying to work around the mess that the other 4,500 people have created. And that was always true. The doctors always came along and were happy with the changes we made because it made their life a lot easier. They made things, you know, work on time and whatever. And, you know, if you think about it, a hospital, a hospital has very natural value streams, right? I mean, think about a, a, a hospital, $500 million hospital probably has uh, a business related to the heart that's 150 million of that 500 million. They have a business that's related to bones uh, that's probably 100 million. They have a business related to internal medicine or that kind of thing. Maybe that's another 100 million. Maybe they have a, a section for babies that's a, you know 80 or 100 million. But no one's in charge of that. No one's in charge of those natural value streams. Right. Not at all. They're all broken up into small different things. And, and so as a result of that, you know, like just take the heart. In, in the heart, you have, you have cath labs, you have stress test labs, you have a lab where they can put in a pacemaker, um, you have cardiac surgery, you have a floor for recovery from cardiac surgery. They're spread all over the hospital. They're, they're everywhere and no one's in charge. You know, I did, I did a, uh, a Kaizen once for them <clears throat> on the floor where you recovered from open heart surgery and they, they didn't have a discharge policy for that. So we were gonna create a discharge policy. So I set it up in a way that I said, okay, look, what I want you to do is every time a patient comes out of open heart surgery, I want you to assign them a day and an hour when they're going to go home. Oh, no, you can't do that. That's impossible. Blah, 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 blah. And so I, I set up a big chart on the wall for every patient. And I said, we're going to chart what has to happen every day over the, you know, you're going to assign, we're going to, we're going to follow it, chart it on the wall, what's happening and make sure they're on track to go home on the day and hour you said. And I want them to all go home before noon because one of the big issues is, you know, if you don't tell them and you tell them at three in the afternoon, they're going to be there till eight at night because, hey, no one can pick me up. My wife's working and my husband's working and I, they can't come and get me. And so, and that means that bed is clogged up and you can't bring a new patient in because by the time you, they leave at eight o'clock, nobody wants to come in at that point, right? So anyway, I, you know, when I said you can't do this, I said, well, all right, well, tell me what are the things that they have to do before they can go home? And they said, well, they have to eat, walk, and poop. And I said, well, that's not too complicated. Why, why don't we just chart that on the wall? So the reality was they could do that for, you know, 95% of the patients, maybe even a little more than that. You could set this time and hour and, and be on track with that all the time. It would help the families a lot to know in advance when to pick them up and all this kind of thing. It would help everybody. But they didn't want to do it because, um, you know, and so I said, all right, I'm you know, leaving at the end of the week. I want you to set up a chart that tracks this, tracks the results and see when you're on when you're on time and when you're not on time. And so we did, and we set that up. And then as when I left, I said, you know, that's never gonna work because even if they have good intentions, there's nobody in charge of this. Mm -hmm. They had heart, open heart surgeons, they had cardiac PAs, the physician's assistants, they had cardiac trained nurses, and they had a bunch of cardiologists, four separate departments, each had its own leader, nobody was in charge of the whole thing. So if they got off track, there was no one there that says, hey, let's get back on track. No, no one cared, right? But that's what I mean by fiefdoms and, and that happens in manufacturing companies as well. You know, if nobody's in charge, you can expect nothing's gonna happen. And if you just look at your results every month, make the month, uh, you know, you're just looking at the, the, the progress, the, the, the processes that you have in place are what created those results. If you don't change the processes, next month you're going to have the same results. Right, right. So, Definition of insanity. Yeah, yeah. You keep doing the same thing over and over and hope for a different result. It's not going to happen. So, you know, lean, lean really, in my mind, is, is very, very simple. 
the issue <clears throat> is always about people and particularly about leadership and management. Uh, you can't manage a lean transition. You have to lead it. You have to be out front. You gotta be hands-on. You gotta be on Kaizen yourself. You gotta be learning lean. The CEO needs to become the lean zealot or you're never gonna be successful at all. Uh, but they can't become the lean zealot unless they learn how to do this stuff. And of course they, oh, well, I'm busy. You know, and I, I always hated that people say, oh, we, we wanna do it, but we're really busy right now. I say, well, I you mean, you're telling me that you're too busy to get better? Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, uh, blah, 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 you, uh, yeah, I guess so. You know, <laughs> that's that's correct. We're too busy to get better. We'll get better later. Well, good luck with that. It's never going to happen. Um, but management is the key. And <clears throat> they, if, if you don't have a, a leader who is willing to lead this and, and really um, <clears throat> explain it to people beyond Kaizans, be working on the shelf with people, you're not going to get very far. You might get a few cost reductions here and there, but you're not going to get much of anything else. And, you know, what I see most companies do is <clears throat> they learn some of the lean tools, they do some Kaizen, but they only think of this as cost reduction and only something that operations should do. They don't think about what, what about, what about uh, finance? What about uh, sales and marketing? What, what, are, what should they be doing? Right. When I went to Wyrmo, my first question was, what percentage of our shipments go in the last week of the month? The answer was 50%. Hmm. I said, so tell me, how am I going to level load the factory, sell one, make one, if 50% of everything I have to do goes in the last week of the month? I don't have capacity to make 50% of a month's sales in one week. Uh, so, so how am I going to do that? Well, uh, that's just the way it is, you know, so... So, well, we're going to change that. We can't, we can't have that. And when we started to dig into that, we found out that the main reason for that was our own sales terms. Our sales terms were incentivizing our distributors to order on the last week of the month. Hmm. And, you know, when we went, when I wanted to change that, I was told you can't change it because those aren't just our sales terms. Everybody that sells to electrical distributors in the whole U S has those sales terms. Now I could have said, oh gee, well that's really too bad. But I didn't, I said, no, 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 we're gonna still gonna change it because it doesn't make sense. We, it's not good for our distributors, our customers and it's not good for us. So we're gonna change it. So what we did is we gave them a little more incentive uh, discount to pay us twice a month. Well, that flattened out the incoming orders pretty dramatically and, and allowed us to deliver more value to them, right? <clears throat> Same is true for finance. You know, uh, one of the problems that most batch companies have when they try and do lean is they, they use standard cost accounting. Well, standard cost accounting, first of all, in my opinion, it is, is something that can't be understood by humans. You know, in fact, I don't even, I'm not even sure the finance guys that, that, that cling to this really understand it themselves. But it's also something that doesn't give very good results. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't give you good information. If you go to a company and say, how many, you know, and I've done this a bunch of times giving presentations, say, all right, how many of you believe that the cost per SKU that you have from finance, which is calculated out to four decimal places is correct. You won't get a single hand to go up. No one believes it. No, it's not possible, right? We spend a lot of money getting it out correct out to four decimal places, but if nobody believes it, what's the point? Right. And I'll give you a good example. When I, after we sold wire mold and I went in the private equity business for a while, one of the first board of directors I was on, I was in a meeting and we were talking about costs and how do we bring costs down. And they, they said, well, <clears throat> it can't come out of direct labor because that's only 9% of our cost. And I said, wait a minute. I think it's probably more like 30%. No, 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 our, our system shows it's only 9%. So eventually about 18 months later, I got them to change from, from you know, standard cost accounting to lean accounting. And they, they came back and they said, okay, Art, you were wrong. And I said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you said our cost wasn't 9% for labor. It was 30, you were wrong. It's 35%. Mm. So if, if you're relying on a system that has convinced you that labor is only 9% of your cost when it's really 
Is that a good system? Are you going to make good decisions based on something like that? Of course not. You're going to make really stupid decisions. And on top of that, standard cost accounting incentivizes the inventory build, right? Because if you, as long as you build inventory, if you're in a mode of make the month Mm -hmm. and you get to the third week of the month, what you want is you want to make all the products that have the most absorption hours. And it doesn't take too long for the guy on the shop floor to understand what products he makes that have the most absorption hours. So he knows that if he doesn't make his absorption hours for the month, he's going to get in trouble. So in the last week of the month, he's not going to make what the customer wants. He's going to make the most absorption hours. And that way he's fine. Everything's cool. No one's complaining about the excess inventory. So everything's okay. So if we're trying to reduce inventory and get more efficient, and my whole financial system incentivizes building of inventory, I'm working against myself. I, you know, it's a crazy thing. So, you know, it's, you got to change that. You got to change how, what sales and marketing do. You got to change what finance does. Uh, everything has to change. And that's, to me, I think that's one of the biggest hurdles. When you tell a company that, look, it, this isn't just something you do in operations. You're not doing it for cost reduction. Everything you do has to change and everybody has to be on board. Well, that's the showstopper. No, well, we can't be doing that. We thought we just had to go over here in, in operations and make a few changes. You know, um, we don't want to change sales and marketing. We don't want to change finance. Well, all right, then don't do it. Keep doing what you're doing and hope that one of your competitors do it. If, if one of your competitors does it, you're going to be dead. Right. But right. if you like doing it the way you do it, then just do it that way. That's fine. Right? Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. And we run into that too. I mean, where some people think, well, it's, you know, all right, let's clean the shop up a little bit and we'll hang some signs. We'll paint some lines on the floor and then we're lean. And to your point, it's like, well, that's part of it for sure. But let's talk about all the other stuff. And thankfully, I mean, we have good clients who we've done a lot of the things that you described where we had, they had oodles and oodles of of finished goods uh, because their supply chain, which Oh, by the way, was themselves. It was just the other side of the wall yeah. was so bad. So they made the decision, well, we'll just run up finished goods inventory to make up for how bad it is, you know, over there. Right. Well, let's go fix over there and we can gradually whittle down your finished goods. Right. And, and to, we have another good client that, you know, we've been working with for a while that it's just as you described they can go, they are the leaders in the market as far as lead time goes. So they are the, you know, the three, you know, the, the three day turnaround garage door guy, but it's going to cost you. But so what's it worth? And, and most, if not all of their clients are happy to say, yeah, you know, because I know if I order it from you, I know I'm going to get it. I know I'm not going to have problems with it. And you can get it fat, you three times faster than, than the other guy. Well, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. I think of lean as, it's really a strategic thing. It's not cost reduction. <clears throat> and you got to think of it that way. And people say, oh, no, no, you can't say lean as a strategy. It's not, not possible. I say, well, let's think about something simple that <clears throat> you really need to do to do lean anyway, which is setup reduction. You're not going to become lean and get high inventory returns if you have long setup times. Just forget about it. So you got to change the setup. Um, so let's just take the case that got two companies, A and B, they buy the same equipment from the same vendors, and now they compete against each other. Except that one guy has figured out how to change the machine over in one minute, and the other guy changes his machines over in one hour. It's the only difference. Everything else is the same. Speeds of the machines, everything's the same. One hour versus one minute. And, and they only, and they each only have, can allow one hour a day for setup reduction, right? So then you say, okay, well, that's interesting. But then I ask you the question, well, who do you think has the lowest cost? The guy who changes it in a minute or the guy who changes it in an hour? And most people don't know the answer, but obviously the guy who can change it in a minute is going to have way lower costs because he doesn't have to have all this excess inventory. He doesn't have to move it around. Blah, blah, blah. There's a whole list of things where his costs are going to be lower. And who has the best customer service and the guy who, <clears throat> who can change it in an hour and he only can allow an hour a day to change over he can only make two different products a day mm-hmm. the one before the setup and the one after that's it 
the guy who changes it in a minute, he can make 61 different products a day, the one before the setup and 60 setups, right? So who's going to have the better customer service? Well, that guy is going to kill you on customer service. So if you say, well, wait a minute, I, I just was talking about setup reduction, but wow, all of a sudden, I got the lowest cost and best customer service. Isn't that strategic? Isn't that what I'm trying to do when I think of my strategy anyway, is to have the lowest cost and best customer service? Well, yeah, it is, but I mean, we can't, you were just talking about setup. I know, but if I don't do the setup, I don't get the other one. Right. And, and it's just, but you know, setup is a, is a very hard thing because it's, it's the easiest thing to do, in my opinion. We, we found at Wiremole that on no matter what kind of equipment we had, if we did a one week setup Kaizen, we could almost always, always get a 90% reduction in setup time after a one week setup Kaizen. Now think about that 90% reduction after one week. You can't spend a lot of money in a week. So it, you didn't do it. You were using your brain, not your wallet, you know? <laughs> so you, you got a lot of gain out of that. Um, <clears throat> so it's, you know, it's something that's, that's easy to do. Uh, and yet it's fundamental to everything else you want to do. If you can't lower your setup times, you can't really get to flow and you can't really respond to the customer. You can't get anywhere near the idea of sell one and make one. If you got a three hour setup time, mm -hmm. you know, if you got a three hour setup time and you change the machine three times a week and you're working one shift, you lost the whole day. Right. <clears throat> so, well, duh, what if I can change it in a minute? I didn't lose a whole day. I lost three minutes. Right. Right. So I'm going to kill you over time. But, but people people will try and do lean without reducing setup and it's crazy, right? What they, what they do instead is they put Kanban cards on the big batches and say, oh, we're lean, we got Kanban cards. No, you're not, you know, you just got big batches. You got lots of inventory. You don't know what you're talking about. Right. So Art, one thing I did, I've always wanted to ask you is when you, so you walk into a room in wire mold and I don't know, you're there a month or a week or whatever it was. And you say, hey, how long does this rolling mill take to change over? And they're like, ah, it's 18 hours. And you're like, I want it done in 10 minutes. How did you, I mean, because obviously everyone's head has to explode at that point. They're like, you're not, like how in the, I, there's no way we could possibly do that. How did you manage people through that learning curve? And how did you, I mean, there had to be people knocking on your office door five minutes later to be like, did you really mean that? Or are you just, you know, are you throwing a, a BHAG out there or like what, you know, how did you get people to understand that it actually was possible and how did you get them to culturally, uh, you know, accept it and support it? Well, we talked about that earlier. We said something that we said lean is learned by doing. So I couldn't just say, go do it. And they would think, think that they were going to do it. Of course not. Uh, so we had to teach them. And so the way we did that was by a bunch of Kaizen's. We started running Kaizen's on that machine. And we formed a team and we put a team together for a week and we worked on how are we gonna go about this? What are we gonna do? We didn't spend a lot of money to do it, by the way. We, we had to alter the machine in small ways. Uh, and, but, but you know that didn't cost a lot of money really, <clears throat> but we did have to do some alteration. And it took us you know, probably three or four different Kaizen's and maybe over 18 months. But each step of the way, we were getting gains and people were sort of nodding their heads a little more. Well, all right, that was interesting, you know. Um, you know, we had another machine. We had a 150 ton punch press, uh, coil fed, progressive die, pretty big machine. Um, you know, it took us three hours and 10 minutes to change that historically. We got that down to one minute, hmm. right? Now, we didn't get it down to one minute on the first try. I think we went from three hours and 10 minutes. Maybe we got to, I don't know, 35, 40 minutes the first time or something. And the next time we got to 19 and then we got to six and then we got, the, and we kept going. We just kept going back and do more Kaizen and more Kaizen and more Kaizen. The problem is what that most people, if you walk from three hours and 10 minutes and you get to 19 minutes, oh, we're done. That's it. You can't do any better. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's not true. You just got to keep going. You got to do another Kaizen. And that and people stop. They, they won't go further because they think, boy, we were three hours and 10 minutes. No. You know, now that we're at 19 minutes, that's that's a home run. No one else can do that. Yeah, but the guy that can do it in one minute can. He he does it in one minute. Why do you was why did you stop at 19? What's wrong with you? <clears throat> I got you. So it's really, I mean, that's really the key thing I think is to get people 
to come along with anything is to it's learn by doing it. So we, we found that the Kaizen process was the real driver and in, in, in training people and getting people on board and, and getting them to do it. We always set up our Kaizen teams with half salary people and half hourly people. And the hourly people were people that were working in the area doing the work that we were trying to improve. They had the best idea of where the waste was. They had the, you know everything that they could contribute the most to the whole thing. I mean, when we went from three hours and 10 minutes on the punch press, I just told you to one minute, the main contributors to that, to that were the two operators that we had. Hmm. You know, once they got into it, they had lots of ideas and we just implemented them. Uh, you know, so it's, it's really doing things like that and getting people involved and, and, and letting them understand what you're trying to do. I mean, think about if, if you were the operator and it took you three hours and 10 minutes to change over this machine for the last six years, let's say. <clears throat> and all of a sudden I, I show you how to do it in one minute. Do you think that you're working harder or less? Is that a good thing for you or is it a bad thing? I mean, you're working pretty hard for three hours to change the machine. Now right. in one minute, but I being, you got it done. Right. So it, it, it isn't hard for you to understand that this was good for you. Mm -hmm. It's not something you're gonna fight. I wanna go back to three hours. No, you don't. You wanna, if, if I try to take you back to three hours, you'd kill me. Right. Right. But so the point is, People, people are smart. You have to understand how they think. And you know, if you show them a better way, they'll do it a better way. They're not going to fight you. They might fight you at first and say, that's a stupid idea, like, like we talked about. But once you show them, and once they participate, if they participate in the change, then they own the change. Right? I mean, what, what happens for most companies is instead of letting the people doing the work participate in the change, you send some engineers in, they look at everything and then they change it. So they're doing something to the operator, not with the operator. Mm -hmm. Doing it with the operator is a much better way to do it than doing something to the operator. Right, because, and I've, I mean, I'm ashamed to admit to you that I've made that mistake early in my career where I was a young engineer and I think I know better. And, you know, even if, even if that idea was better, it, I, I had created it at my desk and I didn't ask anybody. And Absolutely. then I, I presented it to the operators instead of asking them, Hey, what do you think? And, and lo and behold, it didn't, it wasn't even going to work because what I thought was the way they did it was actually not even close. So I learned well, my lesson. I will say early on. Well, I'll tell you an interesting story at one point uh, because, because uh, Jacob's Chuck was one of my, one of my group companies at Danaher, uh, we sold the Milwaukee Electric Tool and Milwaukee Electric Tool started down the lane path. So I knew the CEO and he asked me to come help him a little bit. <clears throat> and so we were doing a Kaizen at one of their factories and they had had three or four young engineers like you just described yourself um, <clears throat> that had, had worked for like three or four months to create the first cell in the factory, the first new cell they were gonna, one piece flow cell kind of thing. They had spent months designing this and whatever, you know, but this was just a bunch of engineers doing this stuff. And I was very impressed because they were willing to put that new cell, it had just started working like a week before or something, it was brand new. They said, let's make that part of the Kaizen teams for the week. By the end of the week, we had we had reduced the space in half, we had cut the manning in half, we had, we had cut the, got rid of the inventory. I mean, the list was all, everything was 50%, more than 50% improvements in every, mm -hmm. every case. And I was very impressed with the three young engineers because they, they just said, wow, you know, we thought we had the best thing since sliced bread. And you walked in here and a week later, you, you know, made us look like fools. <laughs> and, but, but they, to their credit, they, they went with that and then improved that, right? So, I mean, they learned, again, learn by doing, they learned something that the way they had been looking at it and the way they should have looked at it was completely different. Uh, and now we were getting the operators involved and, you know, they, they learned something and they eventually became a pretty good lean business themselves, Milwaukee Electric Tool. So, uh, but I, I thought that was interesting to see, you know, here was a, the traditional way, three or four engineers doing something to you. All of a sudden we got the operators participating and they were participating on the Kaizen. And there was a whole different look at the end of the week. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> Learn yeah, I think it gets back to, you know, how do you, you know, having learned that lesson on the, on the flip side, 
I think it's all, all about how you react to it. You know, if you're think, well, geez, you know, maybe next time I will go out to the floor and I'll just talk to everybody in the, you know, this area first versus throwing the wall up and saying, well, I did, you know, you know, because sometimes it's hard to see that when you, right. Oh. Cause it was, cause it's, it, at that point it's their baby sort of, and you know, it's sometimes it's hard to see that, but I guess it's all in how they're going to, how it gets presented and how they approach it. Sure. You know? Well, think, think about, you know, if, if you uh, have a factory, let's say you're a, the owner and you have this factory and you've got the machines all there and it's sort of a one man, one machine kind of manning thing, right? And every day from the parking lot to get to your office, you kind of kind of walk through the shop floor and you see these guys standing next to these machines, watching the machines work. And so pretty normal. Everything is normal. Everything looks pretty good. Everybody says hello to you this morning and that's nice. Now, when you go home and you see your spouse and she's putting, or he, or, or putting a, a load of wash in the, in the washing machine, and then they put in the soap and then they turn it on, and then they go grab a chair and they sit in front of the washing machine and go like, you know, go like this and watch it go around and around for the next 45 minutes. Now, that to you will seem kind of wasteful. The same thing's going on in your factory every day, all the time. To you, that's normal. At home, the same behavior will seem like waste, or at least it will seem odd to you. Might, maybe you wouldn't come up with the word waste, but you'd say, that's really odd. What the heck are you doing? Right. But that's, I mean, that's the difference. It's kind of like, you know, what you see every day and what you see in a factory somehow are different, hmm. you know, because we've just come to accept the fact that this is going to take a long time to do, a long time to change over, right? So. Okay. Yep. Yeah, it is interesting. We tend to have different, a different set of rules for some, you know, some reason. One of the examples I give for when I do a 5S trading is the silverware drawer in your kitchen, right? That's a standard thing. Like everybody pretty much has, you know, forks, knives, and spoons, and they're in the little divider. Yet, to your point, I'll go on a shop floor and, you know, they'll have three or four toolboxes at, eight machines and none of them are the same. And it's, you know, the tool they need is always not where they need it. And it's over there. Or at least that's where it was the last time I saw it. Yeah. And I'm like, how do why? you know, why, why is it so different? Yeah. Well, it's just because we think differently, I guess, when we get to work versus what we do on our <laughs> everyday basis, it's a, uh, and somebody somehow or other, our brains don't connect those two things, I guess. Yeah. But that happens every place. You're right. Right. So Art, we only have a f uh, just a few minutes. I want to keep you all day, although I'd love to talk to you, you know, all day. Um, we do usually like to take a little bit of a break in the podcast and play a game I call the wicked fun part. The wicked uh, fun part. Yeah, it's just I get a few rapid fire G rated questions for you. Okay. If you're up for it, just a handful. Sure. All right. Uh, what do you think about when you're alone in your car? Don't hit anybody. <laughs> it's probably probably smart. Um, let's see. What did you want to be when you were little? Queen of England. She's rich. Yeah, would be. It's good work if you can get it, I guess. Um, what inspires you? Um. I love to see people achieve things that they didn't think were possible. Me too. I like that one. When are you the happiest? Playing golf. Yeah. Likewise. It's good work if you can get it, right? <laughs> uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Like to be a shortstop for the Red Sox. I think it's, I think, I can't remember. It might be an open position right now. No, not a shortstop. <laughs> no. Well. Second base, maybe. Yeah, that's, all right, good point, good point. It's hard to keep, uh, it's hard to keep up with anymore, you know. But if I could hit a curveball, maybe I would have had a shot, but. Uh, um, how about this one? What quality do you admire most in others? I think uh, people that are positive, positive thinkers. Comes in handy, especially when you're, you know, you've implemented as much change, I guess, as you have. 
Yeah, well, some people are just naturally negative. I mean, everything they think of the, they go right to the negative right away. It's kind of like, I think Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you'll be correct. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> so, so our, again, I honestly, I can't say thank you enough for coming on. And like I said, I could, I could just listen to you talk forever. Um, cause you've done so much and I can, I appreciate it. Like I told you before we hopped on the lean turnaround was one of the first books I ever read it, it, it inspired me. And I don't live that far. I actually, uh, I live equidistant between wire mold and Jake break here in Connecticut. And I was this close to working at Jake break. And I oh, took a job at Pratt and Whitney instead, but it was yeah. way, it was after you were gone. So. Yeah. Well, if you like the lean turnaround, I think you'll like the lean turnaround action guide even better. Um, the lean turnaround action guide won a shingle prize. And it's the story of a company that's acquired and then converted to lean. And it's written in a <clears throat> sort of a narrative fashion where the employees, the management team can talk back to you and, and say, oh, you can't do that. And then you have to explain why. And, and it also uh, shows the financial potential financial results that you get from a lean turnaround uh, in detail. So it starts out with the company with a five-year forecast, and then it's converts to lean, and you see what happened after five years with lean versus what it would have been before. So I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, helpful book for a lot of people, particularly those that are thinking about changing into lean, because it takes you through all the steps, tells you all, all the hurdles you're going to face, how to overcome them, how to run Kaizans, all of that kind of stuff. And I will link I will link to it in the show notes. So when people were, you know, have listened, they can just easily get to it. So I'll I'll make sure I include that there. And in addition, I've I've written 70 different articles for the LEI podcast. And those are all available as well. If anybody just go to the LEI podcast and at the bottom of their weekly podcast, this is a thing that you can click on that says shows all the podcasts. And so I, I write under a, a column called Ask Art. Yep. And then, we, and then we, you know, we ask questions and then try and answer them. So those I'll are... link there as well, which I do read that. I was going to, I was going to bring that up. I love that column. I hope you, are you planning still to keep going with it? Yeah. At the moment. All right. <laughs> Good. Well, Good. They, had, they had one come out today, actually. Oh, I hadn't seen, I've been on zoom meetings all day. So I'll definitely check that one out. Yeah. It's called, uh, let me see. Um, trying to, I'm, I just forgot what the, what the title was, but it was about uh, leaps of faith. Why is why are leaps of faith important in a lean turnaround? Okay, great. All right, thank you again. I appreciate it. Are you going? You're going to go hit the links again today, or you're done? Got to go to the grocery store. <laughs> well, enjoy the trip. All right, thank you. Take all care. right, all right. Thanks again. All right. Hey everybody, it's Paul. Before I let you go, I just wanted to say thanks again for listening. Um, you've really made doing this podcast a very rewarding experience for me. Uh, I get a lot of messages from, from listeners and, uh, you know, everyone has something nice to say, which I very much appreciate. Uh, of course, I'm always open to, you know, uh, feedback on ways we can make it better. I mean, that's Kaizen after all, and by no stretch do I claim to have got this all figured out. So if there's things that I could do better please, by all means, uh, feel free to reach out and let me know. And likewise, if there's a somebody that you think would be a great guest, um, also let me know. Um, you know, there's a chance I don't know who those, who those folks are. Um, so if somebody that you can help put us in touch with, you know, somebody you want to learn more about, certainly let me know and I'll reach out uh, to those folks. But um, I hope you find the podcast fun and entertaining, uh, uh, educational, and, and maybe even a little inspirational, I hope. Um, that's really what I'm, I'm going after with this whole thing. So thanks again. And uh, one small ask, uh, if you don't mind, if you listen, you know, whatever your preferred platform is, if you could just, you know, subscribe, uh, give us five stars on Apple or, or whatever. Again, whatever platform you listen to, it just, it, it helps. Um, you know, the algorithms like it. So if you could do that for me, I would greatly appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Thanks, everybody.